which allows potassium efflux out of the cell, which hyperpolarizes the cell and moves the cell farther away from threshold, therefore inhibiting action potentials. And the inhibition of action potentials is where we see pain relief occur. So in our work, we specifically focus on morphine, a common prescription opioid, and also a pain relieving medication. And we can see that is used to prescribe, is prescribed to treat pathological pain. And we can see here the 2D chemical structure of morphine. In blue, we have the A, B, and E rings labeled. And these are the biologically functional components of the drug, which is also referred to as the pharmacophore. In red, we can see the C and D rings labeled. These are not part of the pharmacophore. They are not pertinent to the biological function of the drug. And we can also see a tertiary amine, which is the protonable binding site of the drug and where all the major interactions occur. So now opioids bind in many different types of tissues. Specifically, they bind indiscriminately or non-specifically within both the central and peripheral nervous system. Now, the central nervous system is composed of the brain and spinal cord versus the peripheral nervous system, which is composed of the peripheral nerves that run throughout the body. When opioids bind within the peripheral nerves of inflamed tissue, this is where we see pain relief occur. So when opioids bind in this inflamed peripheral tissue, we're going to get the action potentials that are inhibited within these tissues, which leads to pain relief. However, on the flip side of this, opioids are also binding within central tissues of the brain. And within central tissues, when opioids bind, these are what leads to the action potentials being inhibited in the brain, which therefore can lead to the side effects that are unwanted, such as addiction, euphoria, and potentially overdose as well. So our work focuses on computationally creating a morphine derivative that will bind specifically within peripheral and clean tissue and not in centrally within the brain, which will activate addiction. And we can see in the figure here that our opioids will bind to an inflamed tissue to promote pain relief and not in the brain, which will lead to addiction. And we can see here the specific pH ranges of acidic and pH uh, acidic inflamed tissue and healthy tissue within the brain. The acidic pH range in the flame tissue is 6 to 6.5, and the brain is at physiological pH, which is 7.4. So Nairi just mentioned to you the discrepancy in pH environments between different tissue types. And so here what we're looking at is a ladder diagram. So following along on the y-axis, we see the pH of different tissues. At about pH of 7.4, this is where we see the pH of healthy tissue, which would be the central tissue like the brain. And below this, we see the pH range of inflamed tissue, which is below this healthy range, and it falls between 6 and 6.5. Now, this occurs because in sites of injuries, like a surgical wound, a burn, a fracture, there's inflammation in these tissues. And there's a buildup of lactic acid and hydronium ions, which lowers the peripheral environment and the pH of this specific tissue. So now, how do we target these different tissue range? Currently, looking at morphine, this is the binding range of morphine. So morphine will bind in anywhere of a pH below 8.2. So as we see, it's clearly crossing the threshold of healthy tissue and therefore binding within both the brain and peripheral tissue. And so below this, what we are trying to do is target the pH range of inflamed tissue, which occurs below 6.5. So if we can start target binding at a low pH of 6.5, we're going to ignore the tissue of the healthy tissue and therefore inhibit binding within the brain. Now, how do we target inflamed tissue? We do so by making structural changes to morphine. We can see that binding is dependent on the protonation of the tertiary amine that we saw. And by decreasing the pK of the molecule overall, we can allow it to selectively bind within lower pH conditions, such as the acidic range of inflamed tissue. Now, morphine undergoes an aqueous deprotonation reaction in the body. This is an equilibrium reaction, and the two states, the protonated and the deprotonated state, switch, and with, depending on the tissue type. So we are hoping for our derivatives, we're trying to promote them to be in the protonated state within acidic inflamed conditions. Now, we're going to make a couple structural changes to the morphine molecule itself. So I'm going to guide you through a roadmap of some structural changes that we'll be making, but we'll specify why we made those changes in the coming slides. So here, we're going to start with morphine, which we have talked about the structure of morphine. We're going to add a fluorine, which is going to lower the pKa of the structure. We're also going to be removing certain bulky groups, the C and D rings, which are not important for binding and increased conformational flexibility within the mu opioid receptor. And we're going to be removing a certain hydroxyl group to better bind within peripherally inflamed tissue. Now, talking about the first step that we're going to do the structure, here again, we are looking at morphine over here. And so this is the protonated form of morphine. And so how do we lower the pKa of the structure to elicit the specific binding? 
We're going to be adding a fluorine at certain beta positions of the structure. So two carbons away from this tertiary amino group, we're going to be adding a fluorine at beta carbon one, beta carbon two, beta carbon three. And now fluorine is a very small but an electronegative atom. And so through induction, we're going to be pulling electron density away from the tertiary amino group, which destabilizes the amino group and therefore de decreases the pK of the structure. Now, this is commonly used in pharmaceuticals and other medicinal chemistry methods for increasing the lipophilicity of different structures. It's also used in antibiotics. So we know that fluorination is a commonly used method in medicinal chemistry. And because it is small, we're not changing the structural integrity of the molecule. And therefore, we're also decreasing the pKa, which is our goal. So the next structural modification that we made to morphine is dissecting the C and D rings, specifically the cyclohexane and the pyrimidine rings. And this is done with the initiative to increase the fit of our derivatives within the binding pocket of the mu opioid receptor. And by removing these rings, we can increase the flexibility of our derivatives within the receptor and provide less steric endurance by removing these bulky rings. And again, just to remind you that the C and D After rings- we the compounds, we then use different oh. solvents to dissolve them. Um, and we characterize what compounds we had created using an NMR scan. So the NMR scan it's C and D rings dissected in fluoromorphine beta C1, 2, and 3 with the respective fluorination sites at the beta position. And the C and D dissection was a common modifi modification that was made with the benzomorphan class of drugs that was popularly used within the 80s. It was known as the universal opioid as it found with a very high affinity to all opioid receptors, including a very high affinity to specifically the mute opioid receptor. They're no longer in use, but this design has inspired us to implement it in our derivatives to increase the fit to the receptor and the binding affinity. Now I'm going to talk about the third structural change that we've made to morphine. So what we've done here is we're looking at the same structures that Nairi had just talked to you about, but now we're removing this certain hydroxyl group from the structure itself. And so I'm going to ask you to think about the protonation state of not only the molecule of morphine in different pH environments, but also of the protonation state of the, of, of the G protein coupled receptor within different pH environments. So just as morphine will change protonation states in a lower pH environment, the mu opioid receptor is composed of amino acids. So there are ionizable amino acid groups within this receptor that will change protonation states depending in inflamed tissue. So here, an in vivo study that was designed to look at specifically peripherally selective opioids found that there was a decreased binding affinity when certain opioids like morphine contained this hydroxyl group. And so when they went to look research why this occurred, they're thinking that it happens because a protonated histidine, which is histidine 297 within the receptor, forms an unwanted hydrogen bond with this hydroxyl group. And so they recommended that if you were to design a peripherally selective opioid, that you eliminate this hydroxyl group, because again, it is not important to the pharmacophore and it may actually decrease binding within these lower pH environments, which we do not want to occur. So this is why we have removed the hydroxyl group as well. So our structures are built computationally within the graphical interface gauss few 6 From there, we submit them for electronic structure calculations with Gaussian 16 capabilities to the Keck Computational Research Cluster here at Chapman University. We use the MO6-2X SMD model on this level of theory for quantum mechanical data analysis, specifically looking at the pK of a amine deprotonation reaction that we saw earlier. And we can see here one of our derivatives, dehydroxyfluoromorphine beta C1, that was built within gauss few 6 in the 3D form. So as Nari just mentioned, our goal is to lower the pKa. And again, the pKa of morphine is 8.0. So we are trying to lower the pKa below this value in order to elicit specific binding. So how do we calculate the pKa? Well, we have to look at the amine deprotonation reaction that Nari explained to you earlier before. So looking up at the top here, we see the amine deprotonation reaction, which is this equilibrium reaction. And so what we do through Gauss view and through Gaussian is we submit the structure of protonated morphine, deprotonated morphine, and a solvated proton. And from there, we get energy values back. And this is how we calculate the Gibbs free energy of the molecule itself. So from here, again, we're looking at the protonated morphine, deprotonated morphine, and a solvated proton. We input this into the delta G equation, and we get the Gibbs free energy of the structure. From here, we input this into the pKa equation, and that is how we gather a computationally calculated pKa of each structure. 
Next, percent protonation calculations were performed for each derivative, and this is based off of the henderson hasselhoff equation that we can see. PK minus pH is equal to the log of the ratio of protonated morphine over deprotonated morphine. We raise both sides to the power of 10 using the benchmark value to get the ratio of protonated to deprotonated morphine, and then perform percent protonation calculations. And this is all done with the aim to decrease the percent protonation in healthy tissue. Percent protonation is di directly related to binding affinity, so we want to decrease the percent protonation or binding affinity within healthy tissue. So now we get to get into some of our results. So looking up here, I'm going to ask you to start to look at morphine, which we use as our benchmark value. So we have calculated the pKa of morphine computationally to be 8.0. We compare this value to the experimental value of morphine, which is 8.2. And this is how we look to see if our computational methods are in fact accurate as to what we're looking at. And so with this benchmark value of 8.0, we know that we're within about a 3% error. So we were comfortable moving forward knowing that this level of theory was correct and that we are in using an accurate method. So from here, we're going to be looking at these three results of these three structures, and we're going to be looking at PKAs and percent protonations. Now, the green text indicates in comparison to morphine, which we're using as our benchmark. So here we see, again, our goal is to lower PKA, that we have reductions in PKA in all three structures. So we have a reduction in PKA in each individual structure, and we also see a reduction in percent protonation within each structure. So in comparison to morphine, we see that morphine ha is about 86% protonated within healthy tissue. And so we want to decrease this to decrease binding within the brain. We see reduction of 13%, 55%, and 84.5%. So this was exciting because it shows us that by dissecting the rings and by fluorination, we've successfully lowered the pKa of morphine in order to elicit specific binding. But now to determine which structures we will move forward with, you may initially look at this 84.5% reduction and go, great, that's perfect. You've now you've lost reduction by 84.5% and that's great. But what you also have to consider on the flip side of this is as we reduce protonation within healthy tissue, we're also reducing protonation within peripherally inflamed conditions as well. So now we have to go to a balance of maintaining high protonation states within peripherally inflamed tissue in order to still target binding and pain relief while reducing it as much as we can within healthy tissue. And so from here, we referred to literature values that have done in vivo studies in rats to look at peripherally inflamed fentanyl derivatives, which is another type of opioid. And they found that a PKA range between 6.5 and 7.2 was ideal to elicit pain relief in the rat study, but also they did not exhibit central side effects. So as you can see, fluoromorphine beta carbon 2 was the structure that has a PKA of 7.04, which is perfectly within range based off this study. So we're comfortable moving forward with the structure. Now we're going to look at the PK and percent protonation data for our dehydroxy derivatives. Again, all of this is done in relation to morphine. So if we're looking at dehydroxy and fluoromorphine beta C1, 2, and 3, we can see that there is also a reduction in the PKA of each structure, and this is due to the inductive effect of the beta fluorination. Again, the PKA of morphine is 8.0, and we see a reduction in each. And then we're going to be looking at the percent protonation in healthy tissue. As McKenna said, this is directly related to binding affinity, and morphine's percent percent pronation at 7.4, which is physiological pH, is 86.3%. And our aim is, again, to decrease this percentage in healthy conditions. And we see that in all three of our structures with the 22.2%, 63.1%, and 70.7% decrease. And focusing on the derivatives within the dehydroxy derivatives that we find that are ideal, we prefer dehydroxyfluoromorphine beta C2 and beta C3 as their pK values that were calculated fall within that 6.5 to 7.2 range, as McKenna mentioned with the rat models and the fentanyl study. Uh, and also with a significant percent of protonation reduction in inflamed con in healthy conditions at pH 7.4. So now we're going to see the ideal derivatives all on one screen here, both mm -hmm. the group with the hydroxyl group and our dehydroxy derivatives. And so the values of the PKA and protonation in healthy tissue are what we've been looking at, but the new information on this slide is protonation within inflamed tissue. So in this tissue, we want it to remain high because we want binding to remain high in order to elicit a pain response. So here we see that we maintain 78%, 71%, and 59% protonated within these tissues. So these are promising PKA and percent protonation reductions that allow us to move forward with our next process. So our next process that we do is we go through a process of molecular modeling. So this is another computational method in which we can visualize and analyze different interactions of our derivatives and morphine within the mu opioid receptor itself. So here we're looking at the mu opioid receptor, and here we see the seven alpha helices, which if we think back to the second slide, when we were looking at this slide within the 
cell membrane itself. These are the alpha helices. And here we can look at the binding pocket in which morphine will bind. And so in here, we can zoom in and look at specific interactions and between morphine and our own derivatives. And so we do this with a program called Maestro Schrodinger. So in the, within the molecular modeling phase, we look at the intermolecular interactions of morphine and the derivatives, and we compare our derivatives to morphine. And we can see here the 2D chemical structure of protonated morphine within this uh, ligand interaction diagram. And again, morphine must be protonated for binding, and we must maintain certain bonds to elicit a pain response. And these bonds include the ion pair bond between the protonated tertiary amine of the morphine molecule and with the negatively charged carbon carboxyl group of the aspartate 147 residue. Along with this, we have a hydrogen bond between the protonated tertiary amine of morphine and the aspartate 147 residue, along with a pi cation bond between the protonated tertiary amine, which serves as the cation, and the aromatic ring of tyrosine 148. We can see within this ligand interaction diagram that the blue shading represents polar hydrophilic residues, while the green shading represents nonpolar hydrophobic residues and the interactions of morphine within the um, uh, binding pocket of the receptor. So Naira just showed you what morphine looks like within the receptor. And so from here, we look at our derivatives to compare that to morphine. So here we see fluoromorphine beta carbon 2, which is one of the derivatives that we found promising pKa and percent protonation values in. And so we're looking at this within the alpha helicy of the mu opioid receptor. And again, we're looking to maintain these three bonds. And we can check these boxes off, then we know that we're going to maintain binding affinity within the receptor. So here we can see the ion pair bond occurs, the hydrogen bond occurs, and the pi cation bond occurs. So from here, we can check these three boxes off knowing that we're still able to activate the mu opioid receptor with our derivative. And so to talk a little bit about the pi cation bond that occurs between the tertiary amino group and the aromatic tyrosine 148 within the receptor, this is actually a novel finding in opioid chemistry. We were excited to find this because the pi cation bond is known in medicinal chemistry in other GPCR mechanisms to activate the GPCR and not only just activate the GPCR, but also to activate subsequent potassium channels downstream of the GPCR. So this is known in an acetylcholine GPCR where they see a protonated ligand like that of morphine bind to a um, aromatic tyrosine residue within the acetylcholine receptor. So we know that if we think back to the second slide where we saw the GPCR mechanism and subsequent potassium channel that must remain open to allow the efflux of potassium out of the cell, this was an exciting find because this may be a vital interaction in opioid chemistry that we did not previously know about in order to activate not only the GPCR, but also the subsequent potassium channel downstream. And so this is a zoomed in image yet again. So what we were looking at previously was the 2D image of the morphine structures within an alpha helicy. And now we're going to be looking at specific interactions in a 3D model. And we've dissected the um, amino acids down within the GPCR in order to specifically look at the ones that are involved in binding. So we see aspartate 147. And again, we're looking at the left on morphine. This is aspartate 147. This is tyrosine 148. And in this model here, we can look at things like bond angles, bond dihedrals, and bond lengths to compare those to that of morphine. And so here we see that not only do we maintain these three bonds, but through our other um, computational analyses, we see that bond angles and lengths remain the same as well throughout our derivatives. So this was an exciting find as well. And so we're looking at fluoromorphine beta carbon two here, but actually all of our derivatives maintain the same interaction. So they were all capable of this specific binding within the mu opioid receptor. And we're just looking at this one for clarity. So in summary, pH selectivity within tissues can avoid addictive side effects that are uh, associated with opioid use. And our data shows strong binding of our derivatives within inflamed conditions of peripheral receptors and not activating the central receptors like in the brain that would lead to the addictive response. And as we can see here in the diagram, our fluoromorphine derivative will bind in inflamed conditions to deliver pain relief and not bind in the brain that would activate the addiction pathway. And this raises a lot of exciting possibilities for pain relief relief uh, medication without the negative side effects associated such as addiction. We would like to thank Dr. Matthew Gardner for his significant contribution to this work and being the best research manager and professor and for three amazing years of research. Um, we'd also like to thank Dr. Maduka Agba for his guidance with all of our computational methods. We'd also like to thank James Kelly for countless hours and meetings with us. Uh, working to submit to the cluster, and also Dr. Jason Keller for being a fantastic 494 professor and mentor and encouraging us as scientists. Thank you.
That, friends, is how you make the rest of the presenters really, really angry. <laughs> so we do, they are going to be great. Uh, but they're feeling it right now, but they're going to be great. All right, we do have some time for questions. So what questions do we have? Yes, Lucy. Lucy. <laughs> I'd love to hear more about why, because you specified it's a rat study, but I always thought that like these types of experiences were done with mice. What, what's going on there? Sure. Uh, so they use rat studies for opioid research because they found that in their mice models, mice are actually missing a specific potassium channel that are important in opioid activation. And so there are many studies out there with computational work and in vivo studies within mice, but they found that they were inaccurate in later studies because they are missing a certain potassium channel that is required for proper mu opioid receptor activation. And so that's why they use rat models because they're closer to the mu opioid receptors that we have in comparison to mice. Thank you. Yes, Eva. Um, so I know you've changed the PKA and all of that. Have you changed other properties? Do you think is it going to be as soluble? Are you going to have other? Is it going to be as deliverable as a drug? So through fluorination, we've increased the lipophilicity of the structure. So that actually helps with invade, invading through the cell membrane. They actually do this in ciproflaxin antibiotic, which they found to increase binding affinity within the target site of cipro. And so we've increased the uh, flexibility as well of the structure, but overall the lipophilicity has increased, which helps with cell membrane invasion, passing through the cell membrane. What's the next, what's the model test, what animal model test are you going to encourage most, I mean, somebody must be laying up to do this, right? Well, hopefully, yeah. But, um, <laughs> um, again, rat models are like consistently used within opioid receptor, re or, like opioid research, like that's probably what's majority used. Probably human trials would be like way down the line, but I would say um, definitely the most prominent animal use for rats. Mm -hmm. Nobody does that here, I guess. No, they don't. No. <laughs> yes, Dr. Fudge. Yes. Sir. So what what is known about the relative importance of the tissue versus the brain in terms of pain perception? If, if it's like 99% brain. Yeah, so they that might be a problem. Yeah. So um they read up until recently they thought um that opioid binding within the central tissue is what remained uh pain relief or is what elicited the pain relieving response. But they actually did a couple of studies where they blocked the peripheral tissues using um, a naloxone target, which basically uh, inhibits the action of the mu opioid receptor. And so this was not able to pass through the blood brain barrier. So the central nerves remained open while blocking the peripheral targets. And they found that in the, um, the rat model that they used and in patient studies, that they did not have pain relief when this was targeted, when they were targeting only central tissues versus when they target peripherally tissues, they found that they elicited pain response. So the central target is actually not the component that leads to pain relief, uh, especially with injured tissue involved as well. Yeah, to add to that, the central receptors are the ones that activate specifically the GPCR pathway, but also the bar pathway, which was very recently found. And that is what leads to these addictive side effects because it activates the mesolimbic pathway. But as McKenna mentioned in that research, it doesn't really impact like the pain perception. Do you have time for more questions? Are there any other questions? How stable, when you build a new molecule, how stable is that? Is there any uh, calculations as to whether um, the, the new setup is stable? So here we look at the free energy values and compare them to that of morphine. And so they're in comparison to morphine. So the free energy values dictate its stability. And so we have uh, co our computational methods show that these should be stable structures when they were actually synthesized. Yeah, we did our computational analysis like in relation to the literature value of PKA of morphine, and they were within I think of like less than three percent error. So we knew that that method was uh, correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, let me see. So what actually needs to happen in order to get these synthesized? That is a great question. Um, we've approached a few synthetic chemists on campus, but we can't build op opioids here. <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> there is a long um, process that you can kind of go through like the FDA um, that like a pharmaceutical company can make, but uh, we're trying to prove it computationally first and then kind of moving on to the synthetic step. Mm -hmm.
questions. Yes. Yes. <laughs> For a lay person. Uh -huh. This is above my head, I could tell you, but what does protonation mean? That means adding a proton, which is like a, a proton, which is a hydrogen atom, and it's like a plus one charge. Okay. Right. So it, it's no, like no. positively charged. Yeah, so if you think charged. on like the battery, like positive side, negative side, like positive side. Yeah. yeah. So things are usually neutral, like in the body, because that's stable, but you add like a plus one charge. Okay. Another question of Matthew Gardner. Thank you, Gardner. How do yeah. you put up with these? <laughs> they're, they're wonderful people. <laughs> but I do, I do have a question. Yeah, sure. Dr. Gardner. Yep. So you mentioned the pi cation interaction, and you kind of like quickly went through like, oh, this is maybe a really important novel interaction with this process. Can you maybe expand a little bit more on that? Yeah, absolutely. So in an acetylcholine receptor, which is a GPCR mechanism, which is similar to the opioid, the mu opioid receptor. Um, they found that a pi cation bond occurred between the aromatic amino acid group within the receptor and a protonated ligand. And so this pi cation bond, they found that when they took away this interaction, that the GPCR was actually not activated. And then subsequent potassium channels downstream of the GPCR were not activated as well. And so it basically inhibited the response of the GPCR. So in opioid chemistry, we know it acts via GPCR, and it's known that the aspartate ion pair to aspartate one what aspartate 147 and the ligand is vital within the interaction, but the pi cation bond may also be vital in this interaction because we see it in similar mechanisms in other GPCR mechanisms. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Dr. So you're sitting on a, a, a paper that you've already published together on this work. And this talk is, is almost certainly going to result in a second undergraduate-based paper for you. Um, that seems like a fine place to start one's scientific career. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about what's next for your scientific careers? Sure. Yes, so medical school applications open this week. I know we're both aiming to apply, but we both fell in love with research um, and this project just kind of fell into our laps. And thank you, Dr. Gardner, for like helping us yes, and along Gardner. the way. Um, so it's just us two, and um, it's been an amazing experience uh, that I think we would like to combine uh, medicine with scientific research, clinical research, and so applying to um, MD, MD-PhD, DO, DO-PhD, um, and just doing research throughout as well. Is it true that you just gave a phenomenal presentation within 24 hours of taking the MCAT? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> you got anything to add for your next steps or future? Uh, our next steps sound pretty similar at the moment, but yeah, uh, this project has made me fall in love with research. And again, thank you, Dr. Gardner, for allowing us to do this with you because it's been the highlight of my college career. Um, absolutely. So, uh, I'm also med school apps open in two days, so those will be being made. But um, as well, looking at MD, PhD programs, PhD, uh, DO, PhD, stuff like that, because I love research and I think that you can make a big impact through research. And um, I would like to continue it. Any final questions? If not, let's thank them one more time. All right, it is 1040 exactly because that is what I do. Uh, thanks for being back on time. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, next speaker, Zach Baker, who's going to be talking about the biomechanics of hagfish eggs. Take it away, Zach. Dr. Baker, I'm going to be talking to you about biomechanics of hagfish eggs. So, this right here is a hagfish. Specifically, this is Eptotritus staudii. This is the hagfish that we use for all these experiments. Most notably, they are known for the slime that they secrete and the skin that's used in manufacturing for clothing and handbags. That is not what I studied. <laughs> I instead studied their eggs. Seen here in this image in their custom made acrylic egg holders made by an engineer who works for a lab named Matt. These eggs are notable for a number of reasons. My focus on them has been the anchor filaments that are found on their tips that help them to attach to each other, to slime, and to substrate. We studied the eggs to better understand their biomechanical properties and how that all works. Before I started the study, there was very little known about the eggs. All that we really understood was that they were 
shaped like this and have these little protrusions on their ends. This was discovered back in 1856. We haven't really touched that data since. Now we have. To do that, I've broken my experiments up into multiple parts. Specifically, we used microscopy to analyze their fine structures and compare that to the drawings given to us in 1856. We then did whole egg tensile tests to measure the amount of force that's required to separate two individual eggs from each other. We did single filament tensile tests to understand how much force it takes to separate two individual attachments. And then we ran breaking point tests to understand how much force is required to snap a filament, which tells us a lot of mechanical properties about the filaments and their materials. This right here is the anchor filament. It's mostly comprised of two main parts, that being the filament and the mushroom cap found on the top. You can see in this image here that there is a groove in that mushroom cap. We theorize the groove is there to help it attach to other filaments, glide down them, and make greater attachments to other anchors. In this image, you can see clearly the fine structure of the filament. The filament is solid and is comprised of a material we currently don't know. This is what it looks like when two eggs are attached to each other. The image on the left is a hydrated egg. The image on the right is dried out. In the image on the left, you can see that the hydration causes a form of bending in the anchor filaments, whereas when it's unhydrated or dry, the anchor filaments protrude at their natural projections. This then informed our decisions for the whole egg separation trials. So this was the data we gathered from the whole egg tensile tests. Each test was run in a cyclic format. We attached each egg and then separated them five times. We did this both dry and wet. Graph A was done with red being dry and blue being wet. You can tell from this graph that there's a sub substantial difference in the force between the first cycle and all subsequent cycles in air, and then all cycles in air as compared to all the cycles in water. This tells us that the material needs to be hydrated and able to maintain its atta attachment forces and to gather the recruitment of different anchor filaments. This is a cycle done in water it's for graph B. Its maximal force is roughly 1.5 newtons. That's fairly small and is smaller than the maximal force found in air when it's dry. <laughs> The forces involved in anchor filament attachment change based on hydration versus dehydration of the material properties. It can also be seen change through each subsequent cycle, which tells us that there is a form of plastic deformation that occurs when they're dehydrated, though we don't see that plastic deformation when they are hydrated. We then ran single filament tensile tests where we attached two individual filaments to each other and separated them. We did this to understand how many filaments are recruited per trial. Right here, you can see that the maximal force for separation of two individual filaments was 0.04 newtons. We go back one slide and see that 0.4 newtons is roughly the maximum for attachments of dried out eggs in whole, whole egg separations. So from there, we can tell that the number of recruited filaments per cycle is roughly 10 at the maximal value. For breaking point tensile tests, we stretched a filament until it reached failure, which is the breaking point of that filament. We did this to understand the stress and strain of each filament, which tells us various mechanical properties about their structure. So here you can see that there's a change 
per the strain of each filament and how much stress it can stand. We can take this data and extrapolate out a number of physical parameters. Stress is the calculation of force per area, which tells us how much force we can apply to this in its given area. Strain is the change in length per unit length or initial length, which tells us how much we're changing this physical structure as we stretch it. The Young's modulus is a given coefficient of elasticity found through stress over strain. And so from our data and breaking point tensile tests, we were able to calculate the elastic coefficients of anchor filaments. This we found that the maximal stress was 76.72 newtons or megapascals, which tells us that the maximal stress that an anchor filament is able to undergo is roughly similar to that of a single fiber in your tendon. The strain was about 0.34, which tells us that we can increase the length before failure to about 34% of its initial length. The Young's modulus was 164 megapascals, which is about three times as elastic as a soft rubber, specifically a silicate-based rubber. From here, we're then able to understand various properties about their mechanical function. So now we have a better understanding of how elastic the material is and how the attachment forces involved rely on that elasticity and on the hydration of the material. <clears throat> As we move this project forward and we look to better our understanding of hagfish eggs, there are three main things we want to, to understand and focus on. Primarily, we're looking to understand the micro attachment in each attachment. So that's how closely the eggs attach to each other and how physically each hook grabs, grabs onto other hooks and other filaments. We also want to understand the 3D printing so that we can generate a model of the hagfish eggs and compare that to known Velcro-like at at attachments and adhesives. We then want to understand the function of the eggs. So how do they attach in the wild and how do they grab onto each other as physical attachments. And most notably, we, we have our own hypothesis about how hackfish reproduce, which is also not currently known. As I said in the beginning, there's very little known about the eggs, and reproduction is one of those things. We have our hypotheses about reproduction based on what we've seen through hackfish egg attachment. And we believe that the attachment of the eggs is important <clears throat> for hagfish reproduction as a whole. Now, I'd like to thank Dr. Douglas Fudge for all of his help and guidance. I'd like to thank Andrew Lowe, who is our animal care technician, for his help in finding hagfish eggs and taking care of the hagfish. I'd like to thank the rest of the Fudge Lab, including Lucy and Anne here, for all of their support and their help. And I'd like to thank Dr. Keller and my 494 cohort for everything that they've done this past semester. Thank you. As I suspected, Zach is right on time, which means he has foolishly left himself time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell me if, I mean, you said reproduction isn't really known, but like how unknown is it? So currently, hagfish have only reproduced twice in captivity. There was an inshore lab studying inshore hagfish that had them reproduce in a cage 50 meters deep. They don't know how they reproduced. They just observed reproduction after it had happened. Um, and then there's a hagfish fishery in Japan that is able to reproduce them that has not explained how. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, this like they're fish. Yes. Are we different ways of reproduction? <laughs> <laughs>
There are many different ways. <laughs> Okay. He's not a fish. <laughs> Is it always just two Velcros on each egg? Yes. Never in, see like within oh. Aptitrius stadii. There are other so within Aptitrius stadii, there's only anchor filaments on the vegetal and animal pores. In other species, it's been observed that there are anchor filaments covering the egg or completely absent from the eggs. So that suggests there's some value to having a string of eggs, because that's all you can form if you've got... Potentially. Yeah. We, we find them in the wild and in our tanks in strings or sometimes in clumps. Have you got a hypothesis for why strings might be better than clumps? Or strings are better than having multiple attachments? I mean, why two? I, so I think that relates to the reproduction hypothesis. Uh, so we believe that they might it might be related to reproduction because we've seen hagfish eggs in male stomachs and now believe that potentially hagfish might reproduce through the males consuming the eggs and then passing it through their simple GI tracts to fertilize them. <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought of that one. <laughs> we do have time for more questions. Go ahead. Yes, they're right. <clears throat> now, you mentioned the fact that these fibers uh, have less, um, uh, very high young uh, modulus. modulus. And is there any interest in determining what that material really is so we can take advantage of that to, to build something which is soft and pliable? <laughs> chemistry associated with that? Yes, we're, we're currently looking into figuring out the material that comprises it. We believe it's collagen. Um, so <laughs> we're, we're currently trying to analyze that. So Zach, uh, these are fish, or I guess some kind of fish, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes. They are fish. There's no such thing as a fish, but that's yeah. better. <laughs> <laughs> as, as a non-biologist, my question is like, the likelihood of these fish being outside of water is, are the eggs actually, right? It's pretty small or negligible. So what is the purpose of studying them being dry versus them being wet? So part of the study into, into their attachments when they were dry was, so, was in part a proof of concept of the idea of hagfish egg attachments and whether or not we could get force values out of that. But it also gives us an insight into how hydration affects their attachment values. So now that we've done them, we see that hydrating this material is necessary for the physical attachments that we've observed. And therefore the material that we're hopefully going to figure out is necessary to be hydrated. Is it similar to how Velcro works? It is similar to how Velcro works. So it, they are structured very similarly to mushroom-shaped Velcro, which has the same general attachment. Um, did you take those amazing photos of the eggs? And if so, how did you do that? So all of the, in, <laughs> all of the images in this presentation were taken by me, except for the hagfish that was taken by Tim Weinberg. Um, I took all of the images under the Zeiss, or Zeiss Axio Zoom microscope using the Axio color cam um, and a polarizing lens. They're great photos, nice. Oh, go ahead. Then. How do you think the mushroom cap structures are made? We believe that the mushroom cap structures are made inside of the eggs and then protruded out. And we think, we believe that partially because we find a gelatin-like cap or, or mucus cap on top of the eggs that prevents all attachment when it's there. The cap also degrades after about three days in salt water at 30 degrees. And we believe based on that observation and some observations from past papers that the anchor points protrude out from individual eggs. I'm going to take moderator privilege and ask the last question. So, Zach, I'm fairly confident that I've known you uh, longer than anybody in this room. 
which included conversations when you were just a prospective student about coming to Chapman. Those conversations uh, stuck with me because you were somebody that was going to major in one of, I think, four or five different things at the time. <laughs> your first interest set. You sort of, you know, found a niche in the biomechanics of hagfish eggs. I suspect that's probably not the niche that you're going to stay in for the rest of your life, but perhaps. <laughs> tell, us, tell us what's next for you. I am, I currently don't know what's next. Um, I'm looking at everything. I'm leaning towards going into some biological research and studying various things that interest me, ranging from the biomechanics to uh, biochemical structures and inorganic components of snake venom. Um, a lot of different interests, hopefully pursuing the path of research. I'll say that's actually a confined list of interests from when we started. We did something right. Uh, we are, uh, we are going to, uh, thanks, Zach, what time is it? Uh, our next presentation is going to be from Lucy, and she's going to be talking about unraveling slime, de oh, unraveling slime deployment mechanisms in hagfish. All right. <laughs> One that you'll understand very soon. So, yes, I'm going to be talking about slime deployment mechanisms in hagfish. And that right there, the, the purple noodle, that is a hagfish. And it is known for producing vast amounts of slime, which you can see there. And um, I'll go straight into how we think it does that. So first off, I mean, you saw that slime, really. The what? Um, it is, again, produced by hagfish as a defense mechanism um, in response to predators. As you can see here, that there is a shark, and it is having a bad day because it tried to bite a hagfish. Mistake it will only make once. Um, because you see it after biting the hagfish, the hagfish releases as much as a liter of slime at once um, and clogs the mouth and the gills of um, whatever predator is going to attack it. Um, and that in itself is good enough reason to study this. But there are also many bi or many properties of that hagfish slime that make it even more interesting. For instance, it is 99.996% water, which is almost an unheard of ratio. Um, and it also has the, young, the lowest Young's modulus, which you know all about after listening to Zach's talk, um, ever before tested. Now, that slime is made up of two main components, mucus and skeins. And that mucus is that kind of snot-looking stuff in the bottom corner. And uh, that's a vast network of glycoproteins that work together um, to hold water. While you have skeins, which is this bundle of uh, tightly coiled bundle of threads that are super, super tightly coiled when in the hagfish. And then they are able to unravel and uh, interact with the mucus to form that slime, which is then able to hold even more water and create, creates a very strong network. And both of those then interact to form slime. So we know at this point a good deal about it. Um, and we know that that little you know, bundle is about 0.15 millimeters, and it's able to unravel up to 150 millimeters, which is a thousand fold increase in length, which is, again, insane. Um, that's actually about half a foot for, you know, all the Americans in the ring, which is incredible coming from this little hagfish. And it is able to, you know, unravel those skeins, interact with that mucus, and form that slime in as little as 100 milliseconds. Now, the big question is, how? How is it able to unravel those skeins and do so so quickly? Well, there are a little bit more pieces to the puzzle that we know. Um, first of all, for slime formation, you have to have convective mixing because if you put, you know, schemes and mucus in the same room, they're not really going to talk to each other. They will eventually interact, but nowhere near as quickly as seen in the real world. Now, um, convective mixing is normally done by the hagfish by thrashing the tail in response to the predator, as we saw earlier. Um, but that is very important to help mix those components and form the slime. And secondly, it is also known that the mucus has to interact with the schemes in order to affect unraveling. Um, is great. And thirdly, uh, there's that theoretical work to suggest that if you take one end of the skein and pin it to something, then it will increase the unraveling than if it was unpinned. And from all of that, get slime. Now, this is another picture. I feel like I have to address this. So <laughs> this was a truck having a bad day, some hagfish having a bad day, and this Prius having the worst day of them all. Because um, there was a truck driving along carrying a bunch of hagfish that they got into an accident and covered everything in <laughs> <laughs> little hagfish and lots of slime. So, I just here. Anyway, on to we're back on the uh, project itself to explain how those hagfish are able to create all that slime. So, 
Our first hypothesis is the anchor point hypothesis. And the anchor point hypothesis really comes down to the fact that the seams need to be pinned to something solid in order to unravel. And that's contrasted with the mucus matrix hypothesis, which says that the skeins can stay embedded in the elastic, not solid, but elastic mucus matrix. And as that deforms, it loads the skeins in tensions, and it, wow, it loads the skeins in tension, and that allows it to affect unraveling. Now, there are a series of predictions um, for both of these hypotheses that we would expect to see. And for the anchor point hypothesis, you would expect that the skeins would be able to attach to solid surfaces. Um, and that the skeins that are pinned to the anchor point should unravel more than the skeins that are not pinned and free floating. And that contrasts with the elastic mucus matrix hypothesis, where you'd expect for the mucus to hydrate first because it needs to form that solid for the skeins to then embed in. And that those skeins that are embedded will unravel with respect to the magnitude of deformation of the mucus, which basically, basically means if you stretch the mucus to the right, those skeins will unravel to the right. Now, we have a couple of experiments that we used to um, help test these hypotheses. And the first one was a macroscopic view of what's actually going on. So this is the view of a water tank that has a live pipe in it that's not been anesthetized, that has a electrostimulator that is able to contract the muscles of the hagfish, which releases exudate. Now, exudate is that 0.004% of slime that is not water. It's just the mucus and the skeins. And um, I'll let you see now what that looks like. So it's this thick, white, ropey stuff that comes out um, before it's mixed with water and formed that really fantastic slime that we've seen so much of. And in this video, you can see this is the hagfish here. These, this is the electrostimulator coming down, causing the contraction of muscles, um, which forces the exudate out of the slime gland pore, um, which then is subjected to water flow. And you can start to see these little white dots they're actually the schemes themselves, but we really want to get a closer look at those schemes. So we have another method. We have a microscopic um, view of what's going on with slime formation. But in order to do that, we first have to anesthetize the hagfish. And we do so in an ethanol and clove oil solution. And then we put a little, and then we electrostimulate that, and we put a little bit of that exudate into this chamber here, which I have to again mention just how unique this is, because this um, chamber is being viewed for the first time ever with high-speed microscopy. And that is the first time anyone has ever seen slime formation with high-speed microscopy. So I'll show you what some of those images look like. Well, not now, but soon. Um, but first I have to kind of zoom in onto that chamber itself. So this gray rectangle, well, I promise it's gray on another image, um, is actually the chamber itself. And it's filled with artificial seawater and into that chamber, you put a spatula. Onto that spatula, you put a glass cover slide. And onto that glass cover slide, you put a little bit of exudate. And then you focus in kind of right along here. And you have two experiments that you can do um, with this setup. You can either keep that spatula stationary and flow water over it. And that provides the convective mixing that is oh so important for slime formation. Or you can um, have the spatula be moved side to side and swipe it along. Now, this was an experiment of, um, or that had the jets so of the water flowing over the spatula, so it stayed stationary, and this allows us to better look at the anchor point. So I'm going to orient you to this picture now. So this here, you can barely see, that is actually the glass cover slide. And this whole thing, that's all the exudate. And these little black dots, those are the schemes themselves, which as you can see, because they are still um, tightly coiled, they have not yet unraveled in these preliminary stills but further on in the video especially in these red circles you can see that they're leaving these little fine thread-like projections and that indicates that they're starting to unravel but we're not seeing with this very dark stuff being the mucus that becomes gradually less opaque as time goes on which you can see especially looking at this bottom bit of the slide we're not seeing any unraveling before the mucus is able to hydrate which is one of the predictions um, for our mucus matrix hypothesis nor are we seeing the schemes themselves, as you can see, staying attached to the slide. They are staying embedded in the hydrated mucus, which is also in accordance with the mucus matrix hypothesis and in direct contradiction to the anchor point hypothesis. Now, this one is a dark field video, and it allows us to better visualize the mucus. So these black dots are still the schemes, and all this white stuff is the mucus, which you can see once it hydrates, um, or 
even after it hydrates, because the thing with mucus is it holds water, and water and water is clear. Um, so it's hard to visualize. So we can see here very clearly that the skeins are indeed staying embedded in the mucus. Now, this is one of the swipe videos, and this shows that um, it's gone back and forth and back and forth a few times. So uh, that mucus is very hydrated at this point. And it's hard to tell with the unraveling with the dark field video. But this is just, again, another piece of evidence that is in direct contradiction to the anchor point hypothesis because we were seeing these schemes being embedded in mucus and not pinned to anything solid at all. Now, this is an anomaly. Of the over 500 video trials that I analyzed, this is the only one in support of the anchor point hypothesis. So here you have a highlighted scheme um, that has started to unravel, which is this little thing coming off of it, and it is pinned to a slide in accordance with the anchor point hypothesis. And then that little tail gets longer and it stays pinned to the slide until it detaches. And then it stays the exact same length, that little tail, for the rest of the video. And that indicates that, or, and that is, again, fulfilling the predictions that we would expect for the anchor point hypothesis, that the schemes don't unravel if they're not pinned, um, and that they are able to attach to solid objects. However, there is the caveat that because this is a bright field video, and I've talked to you about, you know, the tickiness of seeing water in water, um, it is possible that that scheme is embedded and we're just not able to see the mucus um, for it. So the key takeaways of this whole, um, or this series of experiments, is that the schemes do indeed stay embedded in the mucus matrix, which is in accordance with the mucus matrix hypothesis. Um, and it is the mucus matrix itself that is staying pinned to something, not the individual schemes themselves. And um, when that elastic mucus matrix is then deformed by flow or thrashing or whatever, what, you know, car crashes, um, those schemes are able to unravel um, once the mucus is stretched. So at the end of the day, there is more support for the elastic mucus matrix hypothesis than the anchor point hypothesis with that caveat that it is the mucus staying pinned to something solid, not the schemes themselves. So future directions would be to go look at um, a single isolated scheme in mucus and stretch it um, and see if it is able to unravel. Because if it is unraveling, then you know that, um, and without an anchor point, that is very strong support for the mucus matrix hypothesis. Now, finally, I'd like to thank my PI, Dr. Fudge, um, our hagfish wrangler, Andrew Lowe, our PIs, Noah and Dakota, um, my partner in slime, Ann Kenny, and the entire Fudge Lab, as well as 494 class, for really helping with this project into shape. So thank you all so much. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we have some time for questions. Jenna, please. You. Um, how did you guys collect the exudate from the hagfish itself? So that's a great question. I have a relevant slide for you. Um, <laughs> So this hagfish is anesthetized and it's bundled up in these like clove oil and ethanol soaked um, rags to keep it under. And you electrostimulate it using this kind of thing in the background. And it releases what really looks like a pinhead of very thick like think Elmer's glue um, from the pore that you stimulate. And then you take that, you scrape that up with this little spatula here. And you do it very carefully so that you don't unravel any of the schemes because they are, you know, quick splash and ready to go. Um, and then you put that little bit of, you know, exudate onto the spatula. So it's a spatula heavy lap, but just a good way to go. Brooks? <laughs> Have you tried just uh, stressing the slime to find out? Now you have an attachment point. You have the water, so there's a stress. Uh, is there some way of finding out whether it's just the fact that you're stressing the slime that causes it to unravel, as opposed to needing the anchor point? Um, well, that is one of the main questions at the end of the day. So there have we have still been wanting to do trials that um, remove the anchor point entirely. And that is the beauty of our future direction because we want to remove that as a possibility entirely. But the thing with schemes and with slime as a whole, they really love to stick to things. They will stick to the air-water interface um, to affect unraveling. So that has been a tricky thing to actually see or reproduce and see with our high-speed microscopy, but it is still one of our plans. I'm ready for future directions. <laughs> 
I'm going to ask you a science question. Okay. <laughs> so if it's elastic mucus that's sort of stretching and, and putting tension onto the skeins and the skeins unravel, is that because there's sort of kind of protein-protein interactions between the mucin and the skeins, or is that just they're embedded in jello and as you stretch the jello, I, I, could you be looking for, would you expect the proteins, you've got two proteins, are they interacting through chemical bonds or is it purely a physical stretching? It, That's a good science question. That is a really, really yeah. good science question. Um, <laughs> so the skeins themselves are intermediate filaments that are about eight the width of human hair. And um, they go through a, I think, an alpha to beta um, conformation change when they are unraveled. And um, that seems to be more due to both mechanical stress as well as other components of seawater, like the pH and um, calcium and other um, ionic salts and things. Um, so it's possible, it's very possible, that it is an interaction with them, but skeins will unravel on their own um, if you, you know, take a single one and uncoil it. So, you know, but how do you do it most effectively? How do you do it in less than 100 or 20 milliseconds? That's the question. Right. Uh, uh, does anybody know how skeins are, are made, how they're packed? Are they made in specialized tissues? They are made in specialized cells. Um, in the slime, or in the hagfish, you have slime gland pores, and in those slime gland pores, you have um, gland thread cells and gland mucus cells, and they're made in the same spot. And those gland thread cells, in each one of those cells, it is an entire cell devoted to the creation of these schemes, and with each cell having one scheme. And then once those muscles contract, it forces um, those cells out and it bursts their, the vesicles that cover them. And well, you know, then this is what happens. Do you have more questions? If not, tell us about what's next. Well, that's a great question. One that I've been thinking about more than this um, <laughs> at the end of the day. But at this point, I um, am going to graduate. And that's going to be a delight. And, uh, <laughs> um, but also a sad one, because afterwards I'm going to have to figure out, you know, to figure out the next step, which I think is going to be um, taking a gap year or two to get some lab experience under my belt before applying to PhD programs, specifically in paleomicrobiology, because I love the intersectionality and the interdisciplinarity um, of science and whatever else we throw at it. Let's thank Lucy. Uh, and so our next presenter is Tori Erickson, and she's going to be talking about a pentavalent modified <laughs> vaccinia and carbon based virus like <laughs> particle vaccine against Epstein Barr virus infection, progress and challenges. Tori, take it away. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start off today by talking about what is Epstein-Barr virus, or EP for short, and why we care about building a vaccine for this virus. Um, I'll go over some previous research just to catch you up on where the field currently is. Um, I'll then enter into our approach and the um, progress and challenges going on with that, and then we'll go into some future directions. So Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV. So it's a gamma herpes virus, and it's the main cause of infectious mononucleosis, which is more commonly referred to as mono. And it's transmitted by saliva, sexual means, blood transfusions, and organ transplants. And its infection in immunosuppressed victims can lead to cancer. So that leads us right into our why do we care? So there are several EBV-associated cancers, um, including several lymphomas and carcinomas. And there are actually 200,000 new cases diagnosed each year, which results in 145,000 global deaths worldwide. So um, despite this global health burden, there's actually no preventative or therapeutic vaccine against this virus on the market. And today I'm gonna be focusing on talking about the preventative aspect of this vaccine development. So going over some previous research, um, previous research has focused on the um, targeting the EBV entry mechanism into permissive cells. And so what you're looking at here is two EBV virons um, with the five glycoproteins on their surface that are necessary for entry into permissive cells. And the permissive cells or cells that EBV can infect include epithelial cells and B cells. And there are several interactions that occur between the surface glycoproteins and um, receptors on the permissive cell membrane. 
Um, but it's important to know that the mechanism does differ slightly between both of the permissive cell types, uh, but they do involve all of the glycoproteins. So previous research has been focusing on the glycoprotein GP350 on the surface of the EBV cell membrane. Um, and that's been for two main reasons. So the first is that GP350 is the immunodominant glycoprotein, which means that in an infected individual, that is the glycoprotein that the immune system most strongly responds to. So most neutralizing antibodies made in the body are going to be targeted against GP350 specifically. And the second reason that they focused on that one mainly is because it does initiate each interaction with a permissive cell. So GP350 binds first to the permissive cell and kind of tethers the viron to that host um, cell that it's trying to infect and then allows those other glycoproteins to make their interactions. Um, but despite that, clinical trials have found that including GP350 alone in a vaccine construct is not sufficient at neutralizing EBV infection. And so a study released from my lab in 2020 um, showed that using all five of those surface EBV glycoproteins in a vaccine construct does elicit an efficient immune response and is able to prevent EBV infection into permissive cells within rabbits. And the platform that they used at introducing these glycoproteins within the construct is called a virus-like particle, or VLP for short. And that's exactly what it sounds like. It's a particle that's mimicking that EBV viron. Um, and so they put those glycoproteins on the surface and then introduced that to the immune system of the rabbit. And then they saw that it was able to um, stop that EBV infection. Um, and so the virus-like particle aspect of this is not novel in the world of vaccines. It's actually used for the hepatitis B vaccine, but it is novel in using it against EBV. So that sounds all fine and dandy, but actually the methods that they use to produce that virus-like particle um, is not commercially scalable. So in other words, it's not super easy and resourceful to get that vaccine on the corner of every CVS. So in order to combat that issue of having not the ability to make that a commercially scalable construct. Um, our approach is going to be utilizing the modified vaccinia and cara backbone, which is a live attenuated vaccine vector that is easily engineerable through bacterial artificial chromosome or BAC technology. And by utilizing that MVA backbone, we can engineer that MVA genome to eventually produce that same virus-like particle with those five glycoproteins on its surface um, at the end. And it's in a much more commercially scalable and resourceful way. Um, I'm happy to go into explaining how engineering the MVA will eventually result in those VLPs being formed, but my project is focusing here on the genetic engineering component of engineering that MVA backbone. So there was an original construct produced within my lab that incorporated each of the five glycoproteins within different insertion sites within the MVA backbone. So what you're looking at here is this line is representing the MVA genome, and then each arrow is representing a different insertion site that we insert different genes into. So looking at the top corner here, I'm going to be displaying what the finalized virus-like particle would turn into at the end of the whole process. Um, and just referencing that with what the genetic construct looks like that I have on the screen. So what I want to point out here is that the glycoproteins GB and GP350 are located within the same insertion site. And interestingly, what was found was that after transfecting this construct into permissive cells and passaging it many times through tissue culture, um, GB was actually kicked out due to recombination of these two F components. And so it was removed from the construct entirely. And so clearly this is not a genetically stable construct and it could not be moved forward in the process. So the goal now is to build a new construct that has GP350 and GB within completely different insertion sites in hopes to maintain genetic stability over time. And I want to point out again that that same finalized VLP will be made at the end with that same five glycoproteins on its surface. So my goal for the summer was to take a construct that had already been produced in my lab that had three of the glycoproteins already in one insertion site. It was to take that and then insert GP350 and then take that and insert GB. So let's talk about the progress now that I've made. Um, we use pretty standard molecular cloning methods. I'm happy to dive into the details if anyone has questions about that. But the main thing that's important for you to understand the results is talking about the method that we use to physically insert the gene into the MVA backbone. So we took the um, 
glycoprotein gene and added homologous regions onto the ends of it that were homologous to the insertion site within the NVA BAC backbone. Um, and after those homologous ends were added on, we electroporated it to transform it into E. coli that is harboring that NVA backbone. Um, and for your reference, it's that backbone um, that has the glycoproteins already within it, so we can be adding in the new glycoproteins. And then once they're introduced to each other inside of that E. coli, it allows for that seamless incorporation of the glycoprotein gene into the MVA backbone. So looking at the results, um, I'm going to be showing you some gels of um, uh, P, uh, colony PCR of electroporated E. coli that have undergone that transformation. So first, we're looking at the glycoprotein GP350 and trying to insert that into the construct. So first, looking over here, this is a simulation made on SnapGene of what the band should look like if the PCR is amplifying that successfully inserted gene. So when we take a look at the simulation, we see it should be at about 3,000 base pairs. And then we look at our actual gel, and we do see three positive colonies that have successfully incorporated that um, GP350 gene into the backbone. So this was also confirmed by Sanger sequencing. So catching you back up on that overall big picture, we now have successfully made this middle construct here. And the goal now is to take this construct and insert GB into there. So this is now the simulation of where the band should be at if GB is successfully inserted into that backbone. Um, but interestingly, when we looked at our colony PCR, we do not see a band in that expected region. Um, we actually see a band much, much lower at around 1,000 base pairs, and this is indicating to us that the glycoprotein gene did not successfully insert, but instead those primers are binding on that MVA backbone, and they're just amplifying that empty region there where the insertion site is that should have been interrupted by our glycoprotein gene. Um, and keep in mind, we found this result despite screening about 80 colonies and repeating several purification steps. Um, and I'm happy to elaborate on what steps you took to make sure that this was actually not successfully happening. Um, so again, catching you back up, we did not successfully get to that final construct, so we were still here at this middle construct. So future directions, we obviously want to move forward with getting GB to successfully insert into that um, insertion site, and we are going to work on testing for the um, two possible scenarios that could have occurred instead of GB going into the correct insertion site. So we're going to test to see if scenario one happened, which would be that GB inserted non-specifically within that backbone, um, so basically it inserted somewhere else, just not in that intended insertion site. Um, and scenario two that we're going to test for would be that the parent plasmid was preferentially uptaken during that transformation process, um, meaning that that original sample of the glycoprotein gene was never successfully purified from the parent plasmid that it was in, just given the nature of the molecular cloning um, process that we used. Um, again, I'm happy to elaborate on how we would test for those and where we'd move forward knowing which of those two scenarios did occur. I want to say thank you to my team at City of Hope and thank you to Dr. Keller for and my entire 494 group for helping me um, get ready for today. Thank you. Last second, right on time, Tori. So we have some time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> what is that backbone made out of? So it's actually a viral genome. So. It sounds scary that you're going to like be engineering a viral gene and then putting that into people eventually. Um, but it's actually been passaged through tissue culture like 100 ish times, which for some reason beyond my complete understanding made it unable to replicate within human cells. So, yeah, it's just a genome of a virus that you're able to genetically engineer and it's safe in humans because it can't replicate. Yes. And does it have all of like the necessary thing like, like to make the VLPs and yeah stuff. yeah so that's kind of like so we use another virus for that actually <laughs> which I didn't talk about because it kind of dives in really deep but it's called the Newcastle's disease virus um, and there are three components you need to make a virus like particle to have it kind of self-assemble once that backbone is like um, expressed within cells um, so it needs like a matrix protein to mimic that like membrane um, a fusion protein to have like fusing the glycoprotein to the surface um, and then the nuclear protein, which is kind of mimicking that like inner part of it. So uh, now you're going to switch off. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, of those two scenarios that you mentioned for future directions, like in your opinion, do you think that one is more likely than the other? Yeah. So I personally, so I have another additional slide here <laughs> talking about future directions. So I, I mean, it's kind of like my personal thinking would be that it's. I would kind of hope it's more likely that it inserted non-specifically. Um, 
And that's because we have already added like various purification steps to insert, ins um, ensure that there is a fully pure sample before we're doing that transformation. And we also run it on a gel to see that our band is just exactly where the glycoprotein band should be and that there's no other like white showing up anywhere. Um, and we ran that several times and it's completely pure, like to our knowledge, looking at it on a gel. So if the answer is that um, it's not a completely pure sample and instead it's still in the parent plasmid, um, that'd be kind of annoying because <laughs> like we're already purifying it so much, but you know, we could always add more restriction enzyme digestive steps. So that would be the way to like go about that way. So I personally think it might be that it's inserting non-specifically somewhere else because the MVA um, BAC that we're using is relatively large compared to like a little plasma that you use for like vectors. Um, so I'm thinking it might be that one more likely because it's so large, it kind of increases the probability that there's going to be some attraction between those um, homologous regions we're adding and then some other random like insertion site. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, sorry. Um, I had two questions and I had zero. But wait, sorry, give me a second. I'll ask one in the meantime. So Tori, in your GP350 mm -hmm. gels, so you had three colonies that you showed had successful uptake, right? Mm -hmm. Why aren't there small bands at the bottom for all of the other colonies? So in your GB, right, you get this kind of small band that says it's it's in there, right, but it's not successfully uptaken. Why aren't there small bands on the bottom for all of your other uh, colonies here? That is a really good question. I have not thought about that because, so actually, to kind of like get through that thought process, when we found these small bands, we're actually really confused. Like that's not the typical thing that we find in labs or in our lab, at least the way we, that we were doing it. We don't typically just see small bands at the bottom and we're wondering where it was binding, what it was amplifying. Um, and then we kind of went back and looked at where the primers bind and saw that there's about 1000 base pairs in that empty space. Um, and that's why I was amplifying it. So I'm thinking the reason maybe that there's no bands here is I'd have to go back and look at where they bind and see how much region is between them. But it could possibly be because where the primers are binding, there might not be space between them to, for it even to show up if there is a band or like for like the reaction to like not fall off and not even amplify it. Um, that'd be what I'm guessing. But I, I didn't check exactly where those primers are binding to see how much region is between them. But right answer. Um, I remember, if you go back to your other or your previous slide, um, uh, yeah. My like other gel? That, no, just that one there. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember you were having trouble like putting one in and then like the other one out. Yeah. So is it possible that the your construct that you successfully inserted on uh -huh. um, GP three fifty is kicking out um, GB? Um. And yeah. Like, that's have you a... tried, like flipping it. Like if you put GB in first and then. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that that's what's happening here because. So the reason, I right, let me go back to that other one. Um, the reason that that one was getting kicked out was because of like these two F components, which is um, what I kind of answered earlier, one of the NDV F components from the VLP formation. Um, and so it's because these are like relatively close to each other that the, that like attraction of the bonds, like they're the exact same sequence. So like they are attracted to each other. So they like would recombine and kick out GB. Um, I think it's extremely unlikely that like, if you're looking at this construct, that this would somehow recombine with this because of, that's a relatively large region for like those attractions to reach. Yeah. Um, and I think that we would, it would probably insert initially and then over viral passages, like over time in tissue culture, that's when you would see the kicking out happen. Um, but I mean, I guess that's a very unlikely chance, but I mean, you never know, but I, I would probably safely say, no, that's not what's happening. That's a really good question. I'm gonna take moderator privilege and ask the last question here. Tori, tell us what's next for you. Um, so I, really like research um, and medicine. So I'm really interested in going into like clinical research. Uh, I've really enjoyed my time at City of Hope. So it'd be really cool if one day I could like work there. So I'm going to apply to MD programs and just continue research throughout the whole thing. And then hopefully one day kind of get involved in clinical trials and just clinical research. Thank you, for it. All right, so we will uh, stay on time and get started with our next presentation. Andrea is a biochemistry major. And it's going to be talking to us today about the application of artificial intelligence to improve inflammatory bowel disease outcomes, a systematic review. Take it away, Andrea. Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Andrea Benderby, and today, as he was saying, I'm going to be talking about the application of artificial intelligence to improve inflammatory bowel disease outcomes. This will be done in the form of a systematic review. 
So first I want to talk about the background and why study inflammatory bowel disease. So inflammatory bowel disease encompasses mainly ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and it's a complex gastrointestinal disease that involves inflammation in the intestines. So IBD has remained a burden in the healthcare field, but it's currently the etiology is unknown, and it presents uh, very complicated, it's difficult to diagnose, and it's also difficult to differentiate between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So here's some key numbers I want you guys to know. So first of all, there's about 3.1 million adults in the United States which have been diagnosed with IBD and apparently uh, currently 6 million worldwide. So as you can see, it's very prevalent around us. A little bit about the disease, as I explained before, IBD encompasses ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So ulcerative colitis affects the inner mucosa of the colon and rectum, and it has all um, in areas of inflammation, ulceration with no healthy tissue in between. And then there's Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease mainly affects the lower ileum and it has healthy tissue and inflamed tissue dispersed. So there are about five to 15 cases that do not, that involve inflammation of the bowel, but do not fall into either category of UC or CD. Um, however, it's still considered inflammatory bowel disease. And here is an image kind of showing the difference between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. As you can see on the left, we have ulcerative colitis, which is showing ulceration with no areas of healthy tissue. And then on the right, we have Crohn's disease, which has inflammation in the intestine, but it has healthy tissue it's dispersed in between. So there are currently a few different diagnostic methods to diagnose IBD. First, we have signs and symptoms. Um, these common symptoms include abdominal pain and diarrhea. And then we also have imaging, which helps visualize the inflammation and ulcers. Um, and this is mainly done with endoscopy and CT imaging. And then there's also blood samples and stool tests. So one current method of diagnosis is biomarkers. So they can provide support and diagnosis um, with the other methods. So one prominent biomarker involved in IBD is called fecal calprotectin. Um, fecal calprotectin is present in stool and actually elevated levels of fecal calprotectin indicate that there is inflammation in the intestines. However, we cannot solely use these biomarkers due to false positives and false negatives. Um, also, the fecal calprotectin can be elevated due to other diseases that's not IBD. Now, some other challenges in diagnosis. So currently, diagnosis is invasive. It requires access to small areas of the bowel for imaging and biopsy. It also requires a lot of labor and time. These endoscopy videos have to be read by experts in the field. And then accuracy. Currently, as I was saying, it's very hard to distinguish between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And there's also a very wide range of disease presentation. And a lot of the symptoms associated with IBD also could be other GI diseases. Now, some key terms I do want you guys to know for this presentation. One is artificial intelligence, which is a system which uses computers to perform the problem solving and decision making abilities of the human mind. And then we have machine learning, which is a major form of AI that performs repeated iterations of a task and can learn and adapt without direct instructions. Now, the purpose of this systematic review was to evaluate how the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning to gastrointestinal imaging techniques can improve patient outcomes at IBD. Now, how was this systematic review actually conducted? So, the review was conducted using the preferred reporting systems, systemat uh, uh, sorry about that, preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta analyses, also known as PRISMA. And then there's certainty of evidence and bias, which was assessed with the grading of recommendations, assessment, develop, and an evaluation approach, also known as GRADE. So first, it started off, I searched for primary research involving the use of AI, ML, and GI imaging in IBD. And these sources that I mainly used were Leatherby Libraries, Google Scholar, PubMed, IEE, Explore, Embase, Cochrane Libraries, and SciFinder. And in these sources, I searched for the keywords IBD, AI, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease, but I mainly looked for um, artificial intelligence and IBD imaging or ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Now, once I did this process, I screened the tile and abstract of each paper to determine if it was primary literature and if it relates to the study. So we have three main outcomes of the published literature. One included the use of AI in classifying healthy tissue versus IBD. Two was predicting disease activity and phenotype, and three was distinguishing between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and other variables we consider were the age of the population, the data set used, and the type of imaging used. 
So I also had to analyze the certainty of evidence for all these papers, and this was done with this kind of rubric. So first, I considered moderate to high certainty, which is a level, a, a moderate to high level of certainty was defined as greater than two studies, with at least 50% of the studies showing statistically significant results for a particular outcome. And then we have a low level of certainty, which was defined as greater than two studies, with 25 to 49% of the studies showing statistically significant results for a particular outcome. And then we have inconclusive, which was less than low certainty. So what were these what were the results of the systematic review? So this is kind of a flowchart showing the process I went through to actually identify these studies. We, as I was explaining before, there's seven sources and approximately 450 papers were screened, which eventually narrowed it down to eight papers. Um, a lot of the research in this field is very limited right now. It's a very new and emerging field, especially with artificial intelligence. So we had, as I'm explaining, three main outcomes. Those with moderate to high certainty are seen as a bigger portion of the pie chart. So we had that was, we had classifying healthy tissue versus IVD, and then also predicting disease activity and phenotype. And then with less studies available, we had advancing subtype classification, which is identifying also colitis or Crohn's disease and distinguishing between them. Here's kind of a table that is summarizing what I found. So for classifying healthy use tissue versus IVD, there was a moderate level of evidence. And we had identified six studies that had this outcome, and all six of them actually showed statistically significant improvement. Um, and then we had the outcome of predicting disease activity and phenotype. This also had a moderate certainty level of evidence. Seven studies were found, <laughs> and all seven of them had statistically significant improvement. And lastly, um, another outcome was subclassification between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Um, this had an inconclusive, inconclusive certainty level of evidence. Three studies were found, but only one of them actually showed improvement. So now I do want to discuss what this means. So as I was explaining, there was a moderate certainty of level of evidence for AI and ML to improve classification between healthy tissue and IBD and for AI and ML to predict disease activity and phenotype. And this was evidenced by the statistically significant results in all the studies included. Then there was an inconclusive certainty level of evidence for AI and ML to improve self-classification of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. And this was due to very few students, few studies actually showing improvement. Now, there were some challenges that we encountered. So IBD is very heterogeneous. So there's a lot of outcomes to look at. Um, and there's also a lack of evidence between distinguishing between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease already without the use of AI. It's very difficult to distinguish between them. There's also very, very limited number of studies on actually implementing artificial intelligence to improve these outcomes. However, based on the systematic review, we can see that classifying healthy tissue versus IBD and predicting disease activity are actually is a very promising path for research and worth, worth researching. Um, more clinical research should be done to actually understand the impact of artificial intelligence on IBD outcomes. Now, I do want to say that for in conclusion, the use of AI with GI should, should advancement in IBD classification and diagnosis and should be considered um, a path of investigation and can potentially improve outcomes in clinical IBD. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Miklovic, um, he cannot be here today, unfortunately, and Dr. Grant at Chalk. And we actually just received a grant to actually do this research over at Chalk, so that's what I'm going to be doing over the summer and these next few months, um, and actually implementing this research into a clinical setting. Um, thank you so much. Presentation editor. We do have some time for questions. Yes. <clears throat> the papers that you looked at, were they the ones going through and doing the uh, inserting into the, the learning process with so many that were successful and so many that were not? Or, when, or was that the work that you did? Yeah, that was the work that I did. So actually, the studies that I looked at, um, I can actually, I have a few, some, a few slides showing. So here, for example, one of the studies was to improve subtype classification. So the studies that I looked at were actually performing the clinical research. Um, and it pretty much, I was trying to see how many of these studies actually show a statistically significant improvement and is it worth it to keep working, like studying in that field? Because you see machine learning, you go through it plus a series of cases in that yeah. are positive yeah. uh, in terms of the results. Is that what you did? Is no, so what the artificial intelligence does is um, pretty much you have an endoscopy image or an endoscopy video 
And we trained this machine learning by implementing thousands and thousands of images. We put that through the machine learning. And then in those images already have a pre like a diagnosis. So let's say I'm input, inputting a slide of someone who has Crohn's disease. The AI like learns and adapts. So it goes, okay, this is Crohn's, this is Crohn's, this is Crohn's. And when it sees a new video, it can have to diagnose it automatically. So you ran those cases. That's what we're going to be doing. So that's just the prelim idea. research. Yeah. 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 Yes. So in all these studies, in terms of like the algorithms they used yeah. for for your for machine learning, were they using the same ones? Was it consistent or was it inconsistent? Did that sort of play a role into why you maybe saw in those like two cases some significant results yeah. versus? So we did find like a common pattern that a lot of these studies use the same data set. So if they use um, like an AI system that's already been developed. Um, that has it has the same the data set used to make this like machine learning system was the same for several of the studies, but it didn't really like those even though they all use the same data set they still had different um, outcomes. So, is it possible that it's just a continuum between the two? Are you assuming that these are distinct diseases? Is everyone assuming that, or like, what are the assumptions going? Into yeah, this? between ulcer colitis and Crohn's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yes, there there is a difference. However, it's it's really hard to diagnose, which is why um, hopefully using AI can make that easier. Um, but yeah, the IBD comprises of ulcer colitis and Crohn's. There are like those cases that don't go into either one. But yes, there's there is they are. Different, different parts. But it, it, they're not just a continuum. Like they're, they're distinct. Um, I'm not. Yeah, they are distinct. They are, they they are supposed to be distinct, but I'm honestly not quite sure um, exactly if it's just more of a spectrum. If, if it's more of a spectrum, will the will the artificial intelligence detect that? Yeah. So there was one of the studies which detected that um, they. They were trying to not only distinguish between ulcer colitis and Crohn's, but they were also trying to see why, what is so similar between these diseases and what makes it so difficult. And they actually found a good amount of, they found good data on why they are so similar and I, and the AI will also be able to detect that. Yeah. I know how exhausting literature searches can be. <laughs> so my first question is how did you handle uh, like searching fatigue? And then the second one is um, when you were doing this, what do you think your greatest challenge was? Yeah, so this research was done over like a, a several, several months. So I had um, a lot of time to actually go through these databases, which definitely helped with the fatigue. Um, and also this was a very new topic to me. So like I was very interested in everything that I was seeing and it made me really want to dive in and learn more and more and more. So um, I think that definitely helped with me not getting too tired when I was going through it. Um, and then I would say the greatest challenge um, for this systematic review, this is the first time that I've really encountered a systematic review. Um, like the Prisma, what we use to go through the methods, is not something I'd ever seen before. So it's definitely kind of a challenge over like that mode, like the like an average science experiment. Like this was definitely different. I wasn't used to it. So I definitely had to overcome some challenges and even understanding what a systematic review was. Yeah. So how does this current AI results compare to experts in the field and properly diagnosing? Yeah, great question. Um, so pretty much these studies were compared to their reference was an endoscopist scores. So like the physicians who scored these endoscopy videos, that's what the AI was compared to. And it was very successful. Um, for example, like here, the AI detected 70% of ulcers that the physician detected. They also detected nine ulcers that were even that were missed by the endoscopists. Um, and so there's definitely definitely there's a lot of research that shows that it's beneficial, especially because these videos, like some endoscopy videos, are almost 20 minutes long, and the AI can read it in about 20 seconds. So it's a huge improvement from an endoscopist going through it. Oh. <laughs> So for, I know you said going forward, you're gonna work on chalk and kind of develop the rest of this. Yeah. For that, is there anything that you've seen in all of this research and the application of machine learning and AI 
to the identification of these problems that you think you would change? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. So we are going to be um, implementing AI to predict disease activity. So that's kind of, um, here I showed like three different outcomes, but we're mainly focusing on predicting disease activity. Um, and so that's like identifying if a patient is in remission, um, identifying if they have ulcers, identifying if they have inflammation. So we're not going to be really focusing um, on like distinguishing between ulcers and Crohn's. We're mostly focusing on the actual disease activity because um, right now, like biopsies are required to diagnose, which is pretty invasive. And there's also like areas of the intestines which are stenosed and super inflamed. And then the camp, the endoscopist camera, like can't really get through those areas. So, yeah, that's what we're going to be working on. I don't know if I answered your question, but I don't think there's anything I would change. So I'll ask the last question, yes. which is tell us about what's next for you. Yeah, so um, as I was saying, just about the grant for this research, so I'm going to be doing that chalk um, for as long as possible. I've, I've really, really enjoyed this research, and then I'm going to be um, applying to MD schools in the next year. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and so Jose is going to start recording for us. Looks like he already has. So our next speaker joining us uh, remotely from someplace more fabulous than AF201 uh, is Sarah Nunes, who's going to be talking about how poor sleep is associated with increased inflammation levels in women. Sarah, take it away. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I wish I could be with you in person today. So hopefully Zoom cooperates with us. As Dr. Keller said, I'm going to be discussing my research that I completed at City of Hope about how poor sleep is associated with increased inflammation levels in women. Specifically, I'm going to be exploring the relationship between poor sleep, inflammation, and disease. So previous research has already established how inflammation is linked to disease, but there has been a less clear link between how poor sleep is linked to inflammation, specifically chronic inflammation. The goal of this project is to determine if chronotype and sleep quality are associated with elevated inflammation levels, which may result in an increased susceptibility to cancer and other disease risks. So inflammation is not always bad. So when you have a cut or an injury, you have immune cells that will travel to the area and release cytokines or different inflammatory biomarkers that will help the healing process. But when inflammation becomes chronic or you have overactive immune responses, that is when it has been linked to an increased risk of cancer and other diseases. So inflammation can be detected and quantified in the blood through inflammatory biomarkers such as cytokines, chemokines, and their receptors. And we'll be specifically looking at how chronic inflammation and the causes of this chronic inflammation is linked to different diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer of adults in the US, as well as cancer and inflammatory bowel disease. So a little bit more about the biology of how these inflammatory biomarkers or cytokines work. So immune cells such as macrophages will release these different inflammatory biomarkers to either have a pro-inflammatory or an anti-inflammatory effect. And I will be specifically looking about how sleep, specifically sleep quality and chronotype, which is whether someone is a morning or an evening person, interacts with this process. I was able to gather data on sleep through the California teacher study, which is a unique opportunity because it is a very large cohort of women who self-report different lifestyle characteristics through questionnaires over many years. Specifically, I was looking at two questions from questionnaire five, which documented sleep quality and chronotype. Sleep quality with the question, during the past month, how would you rate your sleep quality overall, ranging from very good to very bad? And chronotype with the question, one hears about morning and evening types of people. Which of these types do you consider yourself to be at different times in your life? Specifically, I looked at their answers for now, and it ranging from definitely a morning type to definitely an evening type and everything in between. So a little bit more about the data available through the California teacher study. So there have been questionnaires taken from 1995 all the way up until present day, 
Specifically, I am focusing on this timeline around 2013 to 2015, where the blood survey was taken, as well as the most recent questionnaire concurrent with that blood survey, which was questionnaire five. So a little breakdown of my population that I was studying for this research. So the original cohort started with about 133,000 women. Of that, 65,000 completed questionnaire five. About half of that donated biospecimens. And then from there, 838 participants actually had cytokines or their inflammatory biomarkers measured. Although this number seems that it's got a lot smaller from the original cohort. This is still a really unique opportunity to study a variety in different sleep patterns in relation to these serologic inflammatory biomarkers. So a little bit about the distribution from the 823 participants who actually had their cytokines measured versus those who answered questionnaire five. You can see for chronotype, the answers are pretty representative of each other. And again, with sleep quality, with the 823 participants, this is reflective of the total population who answered questionnaire five. So a little bit more on the methods on how we obtained the, the data of these inflammatory biomarkers. So the blood samples were obtained through the California teacher study from 838 participants which had their blood frozen and sent overnight to the Martinez Maza lab at UCLA. And the development and validation of multiplex assays actually allowed us to evaluate various biomarkers simultaneously, which was new in this field as previously, you would have to measure only a few at a time, but we actually were able to quantify 16 serologic inflammatory biomarkers. And from this data, I was able to dichotomize each of these 16 biomarkers by either median, if it was below 25% undetectable, or by detectability, if it was above 25% undetectable. And so a little breakdown of this umbrella term inflammatory biomarkers, this encompasses chemokines, cytokines, and other. Chemokines are in the cytokine family and they induce cell migration. Cytokines, they are inflammatory um, biomarker that is released by different immune cells, and they can actually have either pro or anti-inflammatory effects. So the blue um, cytokines here, those are actually anti-inflammatory. And then other just encompasses the receptors that bind either these chemokines or cytokines. And so all of these fall under the umbrella term inflammatory biomarkers. And here we looked at the percent agreement between any two cytokines in these participants that had their blood taken. So the percent agreement is below 75% or even lower for all of these, which shows that the cytokines are largely measuring different immune responses, which just allows us to look at each one of these more individually. And now looking into the results. So a little bit about how I got these results is we ran odds ratios tests um, with 95% Wald's limits to see if any of these 16 biomarkers were associated with either sleep quality or chronotype that I mentioned earlier. So interleukin-8 is one of the biomarkers that actually showed significant results. So a little bit about interleukin-8, it's a pro-inflammatory chemokine and it induces phagocytosis and it's also a promoter of angiogenesis or new blood vessel formation. So thanks to an amazing statistician at City of Hope, he was able to help me with the coding on SAS to gather the statistical analysis. And so this is an odds ratio graph with 95% walled confidence limits. And so how we interpret it is if the 95% walled confidence limit doesn't cross over the one with the reference group of very good, then that is a significant result. So here we saw that very bad sleep was associated with elevated interleukin-8 compared to the reference group of very good sleepers. So here we're looking at interleukin-6 receptor. So interleukin-6 has a large role in the initiation of inflammatory and immune response. 
So here you see chronotype on the graph as well, because we did see some significant results there. And so again, we saw that very bad sleep was associated with having elevated interleukin-6 receptor alpha. As well, we saw that more evening than morning person was associated with a decreased interleukin-6 receptor as compared to the reference group of morning type. And that fairly good sleep was also associated with elevated interleukin-6. So those results were a little bit interesting with the overall trend that we were finding, um, but important to know. And here with tumor necrosis factor alpha, we saw again a significant result with very bad sleep. TNF alpha serves as an immunostimulant and is a mediator of inflammatory responses. So we're again seeing this pattern of having very bad sleep with upregulated inflammatory biomarkers. And then our final result that we saw had a statistical significance was with interleukin 10, which is interesting because this actually has an anti-inflammatory role in the body. But we again saw that it was upregulated when people report self-reported very bad sleep. Overall, we did see this trend that the different immune markers were upregulated with very bad sleep as compared to the reference group of very good sleep, specifically interleukin-8, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interleukin-10. So in conclusion, self-reported very poor sleep quality was positively correlated with elevated IL-8, IL-10, IL-6RA, and TNF-alpha cytokines. I put IL-8, IL-10 in blue to note that this was actually anti-inflammatory, which warrants some further investigation on to why that might be. And IL-6RA was also associated with more evening than morning person and fairly good sleep. But overall, the main takeaway from what we found is that this suggests California teachers may be at an increased risk for adverse health effects due to elevated inflammatory biomarkers when experiencing poor sleep, regardless of the timing of that sleep. In the future, it will be interesting to look at sleep characteristics over a longer period of time in relation to these serologic inflammatory biomarkers to see if there is, if it's chronic poor sleep over many years with um, uh, the serologic inflammatory biomarkers being taken at different points throughout that. And again, it would also be interesting to make a more uh, direct relationship with an experimental design exploring uh, poor sleep in these biomarkers. However, that does pose some ethical implications. And then I just wanted to thank my mentor at City of Hope, Dr. Sophia Wang, as well as MSB of Vogel and the rest of the City of Hope Epidemiology Department. Also, Eugene and Ruth Roberts Summer Academy for allowing me to complete this research. And Dr. Keller and the rest of the Biology 494 cohort for helping me work on this presentation and paper this semester. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Great. You are spot on on time, which means that you have foolishly left yourself time for some questions. And so we do have some questions in the audience. I'm just going to go around and call out people for you, Sarah, but I'll let them uh, say their question and it'll get picked up by the microphones. Please. Yes. Um, is there any correlation between the thing that's causing the, uh, the inflammatory and therefore the biomarkers? And it's called, is it causing the poor sleep or is it the sleep that's causing the additional uh, inflammation? Which way? Yeah. So with the statistical analysis that we did, we can't make a uh, we can't make a causational relationship between the two. It's just that they are associated. So further research needs to be dived in to establish either a causational relationship either way. That's my exact same question. I'll ask, <laughs> it's a great question. I'll ask a, I'll ask a second question. I'm curious, when you talk about the survey, do you have a sense of how validated it was, meaning how, do you have a sense of how accurate someone's self-reporting their sleep is? Was there any kind of comparison to make sure that people are good at self-reporting their own sleep and type of person they are, like morning versus evening? Also, amazing, amazing work. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. So there was never 
any like tests to like verify what their sleep was. It's all based on self-reporting. So there's no way to verify how accurately they are, but given with most survey types of tests, people probably underreport poor sleep and there could be some variations there. So that's a, definitely a limitation in it, but granted it's a very large sample set. Um, it still gives us some good information to look forward in the future. Thank you. Let's go here and then here. Can you um, tell us a bit more about the odds ratio statistic? I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so the odds ratio is from my understanding, so it was with the help of the statistician over at City of Hope uh, running the actual code and then me and my mentor looking at it, but it's comparing the each cytokine with either sleep quality or chronotype in relation to a reference value. So chronotype, it was referencing morning type and with sleep quality it was referencing very good sleep. And so all of the biomarkers were dichotomized either into um, above median or below median or detectable or undetectable, and then cross-referenced with um, each of the either sleep quality or chronotype. So from my understanding, it's with those 95% WALDS limits. If that doesn't cross with the one or the reference value, then there is a statistical significance with either um, it's greater than that reference value compared to that reference value, or it's below it if it's on the left hand side of the one. Yeah, good. Good. I'm interested to know if you guys did any age adjustments to the data, because it would be interesting to see if you could see like our younger teachers, you know, do they have the higher level of cytokines versus older teachers? Because I know it can kind of get soupy if you're kind of combining all these age stratas. Yeah, that is very interesting. So a lot of the teachers are relatively around the same age. If you have some uh, distribution graphs of what those age looks like that I can, um, we can connect later and look at that if you would like. But they're relatively, um, based on my memory, around the same age and also, uh, the project continued after I left City of Hope and they looked at different factors such as age, smoking, socioeconomic status, and did a multivariate design, um, kind of combining all of the different factors. Sarah, I'm going to ask the last question, and that is, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's next for you uh, once you leave Chapman? Yeah, so I'm actually planning to take the MCAT in September hopefully going off to medical school. I'm interested in doing dermatology and continuing different research throughout uh, medical school and during my gap years. Awesome, great. One more time, let's thank Sarah. For our uh, final presenter in our session this morning is Laura Lynam, who is an environmental science and policy major. She's gonna be talking about some work that she's already published actually looking at California drought projections based on climate change models, effects on water availability. Lauren, please feel free to take it away. So I'd like to just start off by thanking you all for being here today. Um, and I would like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Pichota for really getting me through this research and making um, publishing this research possible. And Dr. Keller, thank you for facilitating this and everything else the past four years. So let's see. There we go. So just to start off with a little bit of background, um, we all know that the Southwestern United States is going through major drought issues um, recently the past few years, and we know that it's going to only get worse from here. So of course a drought means there's going to be decreased water availability, but that means that there's going to be increased competition among water sectors. And that will affect economic security, not only at the state level or at the city level, but among communities themselves, depending on um, financial status and um, their ability to create policies to make sure that they get the water they need. And so looking here on the right side of the screen, um, this is the Colorado basin from 1980 till now. It looks like two completely different locations just because of the amount of water that is missing um, compared to 1980s. And this is just within you know, 40 years. That's a huge drop, you know what I mean? Just looking at the width of the basin. So there have been previous studies on this topic um, 
but no direct connection between climate change and stream flow indexes. But previous studies have been done um, on general climate models and their effects on climate change, as well as precipitation stream flow indexes to analyze droughts in other countries. But again, no analysis that connects climate models and droughts within the United States. So that's what this research is doing. Um, so we are conducting drought analysis, or we have conducted drought analysis based on general climate models. And the purpose of this is to enable California's water management to understand drought implications, um, allowing for better preparations and planning for the future. So just starting off here with the methods, um, on the right side, this is a map I created using GIS. You can see the 11 rivers we used to collect data from. So we collected historical data uh, from, 19, from 1950 to 2015, collecting stream flow um, in the measurement of feet cubed per second um, of 11 California's major rivers. And we also collected the projected stream flow from 2020 till 2099, and again, feet cubed per second for each of the rivers. And so this projected data is split up into two different emission level possibilities. Um, and that will be um, analyzed through represent representative concentration pathways, or RCP for short. Um, so here you can see we have an RCP level of 4.5 and 8.5. 4.5 is basically where we're at now, um, a high level of, of emissions, but not as intense as it could be. And RCP 8.5 is going to be a higher emission level, increased um, greenhouse gases in the air and all of that. So under the two emission level possibilities, we have four different, um, let's call them climate reactions to the emission level. So warm dry would be warmer and drier than things are now. Cool wet would be cooler and wetter than things are currently, and average is you know, somewhere in between the two. And other is the um, model most unlike the other three. And so that data was developed by the Scripps Institute, um, and it's a very reputable source. A lot of people have used this data to analyze things. And so once we collected that data, we converted um, the the unit of feet cubed per second to million acre feet, which is a more standard unit of water um, and can be used more thoroughly in policy development. Um, so to start off before even really touching the data, we identified a drought as two or more years where stream flow is below the historical average. So say the historical average for Bear River is 50 million acre feet. But in two years, say 2050, it's 40 million acre feet. And then 2051, it's 41 million acre feet. So that's two consecutive years in which the projected stream flow is below the historical stream flow. And so we also divided the drought categories, or the drought measurements into three categories, which are quantity, duration, and intensity. So the quantity is the summation of the stream flow deficit in each individual drought. So say a drought goes for two years and you know each year there's 10 million acre feet missing, the total drought quantity would be, um, yeah, would be 20 million acre feet of water per, uh, 20 million acre feet of water total. And the drought duration is self-explanatory. That's just the total number of years of the drought. And the drought intensity is the million, is the drought quantity divided by duration, giving us a uh, million acre feet per year. And so of course we have all these different uh, data points, all these different rivers. And if one river typically has a high level of stream flow, that's very hard to compare um, these, these measurements with a river that has a lower level of stream flow. So we standardized all of the data using a z-score. And after standardizing the data, we did a difference in means t-test on the standardized data at a significant level of 0.05. And in doing the difference in means t-test, we compared historical values with projected values. Um, and we did this for individual rivers and an aggregate of the standardized values. So here's our first result. This is all of the rivers all together, um, dependent on the emission level and the climactic conditions. Um, so we have warm dry RCP 4.5 all the way to other RCP 8.5. 
And just looking at the data here, you can see um, a pattern forming. So warm, dry, and other tend to have drier conditions, meaning a larger deficit or a longer duration than historical. And we can see here an average in cool wet, it's wetter conditions. So that means shorter, um, uh, shorter period of drought and a lower deficit than historical. And this is again, all of the rivers combined. Um, so just a general read on California altogether. And here we have the rivers separated up. And again, same key, the drier conditions um, are in the salmon color, the wetter conditions are in this blue color, and the pattern continues. Um, we have warm dry RCP 4.5 and warm dry RCP 8.5 having the drier conditions and the average RCP 4.5 and cool wet RCP 4.5 having the wetter conditions. So, you know, a similar pattern as we saw in the last um, aggregate section. Hey, Lauren, I'm going to interject. Can you go back one slide, please? Yes. I'm really sorry. Uh, nope, go forward one more. Stop. Uh, the screen that we're on in the room has a really, really horrible bulb in it, and we're having a hard time seeing your colors. Can you just go through and, and show us where you see salmon colors on your table? Yeah. Just quickly. So where are you seeing drier conditions? Can you see my mouse? I can see. We can see your mouse. Okay. I'll just hover over it. So this right. is a drier condition right here, right here, and here, and then this large section here for Great. feather and you it's even worse at showing wetter conditions. And show me where your wetter conditions are. Okay, um, so it's the deficit for Sacramento, duration and deficit for Feather, deficit for Tulumna, uh, duration for Merced, and deficit for San Joaquin. Great, thank you so much, keep going. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at all. So here is a graph of just the Yuba River. Um, comparing historical values and the projected values by the model of the warm dry RCP 8.5. Mm -hmm. And even just looking at this, you can see that these bars are so much thicker and taller. So the width is the number of years and the height is the total um, amount of water in the deficit that's missing. Um, and the historical worst is four years long versus 11 years long for the projected. And the historical, um, Highest amount of drought deficit is 24 million acre feet, but projected it's going to be 73 million acre feet. And that's only for this warm dry RCP 8.5 model for this river. And on the other hand, here we have San Joaquin River um, projected by cool wet RCP 4.5. And again, just looking at it, you can see that the droughts are becoming less frequent and less intense overall. And so Previous research has um, projected that droughts may become more prevalent in future years, no matter the climate model. But this research suggests that that is only really likely to occur if real world events follow the warm, dry, or RCP 4.5 or 8.5 climactic models. And vice versa, drought may occur less if real world events follow cool, wet, or average models. And so, if real world events do follow the warm, dry, or other climate models, we're going to need to utilize other water sources. And previously, groundwater has been used a lot, but this may lead to a lot of socioeconomic issues as well as environmental issues, such as seawater intrusion, which is when ocean water comes into the fresh groundwater, wetland devastation, which will lead to serious CO2 sequestration issues, and other climactic feedback loops. Not to mention that only you know, wealthy people will be able to dig far enough into the ground to get that fresh water. And poor communities might not have access to clean water. And if uh, real world situations follow the projections by the cool wet and average climactic models, we're going to have a larger than historical stream flow, which could mean flood damage, welfare reduction, and human losses. And again, not to mention that California is a big agriculture state. If we have flooding, it could devastate um, our food sources. Uh, yes, and so just to sum up everything that was conducted um, in this research, we 
We hope to anticipate the droughts dependent on climate models, um, depending on what the real world situation is going to look like. We can use these models to predict the quantity of water missing within each drought and the duration of each drought to better enable water management teams to plan um, for future impacts and understand the implications of potential climate models. Further research needs to be done on the repercussions of overdrawing groundwater. There are a lot of issues there, socioeconomic as well as environmental. And we also need to identify areas in California that are most susceptible to river flooding that are by those basins in which the uh, data was collected. And if we do this, then communities can best mitigate the effects of drought. Um, further research is actually being done already based off of this research by another student at Chapman Rama alongside Dr. Pashoda. And I'm really excited to see what they come up with. They're focusing on the Colorado River Basin. Um, so yeah, that'll be interesting to hear about. And that is it. Um, here are my sources if you want to look at them later. But like Dr. Keller had mentioned, this research is published and you can scan this QR code to take a look at it uh, more closely if you'd like. But thank you guys so much um, for coming to this. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and open the floor for questions. Right. Great job, Lauren. Thanks so much for doing this. I should also point out that Lauren technically has not been a student for the entire semester. And so the fact that she's willing to jump back on on a weekend to wrap this up says a whole lot about her. So congratulations, <laughs> Lauren, on a great presentation. Thank um, you, let's bro. open the floor for questions. And I'm going to see if there's any questions in the physical room first, and then I'll open it up to uh, the folks that are joining us on Zoom. So do we have any questions in the room? Were there less, was there certain rivers that were less susceptible to uh, uh, low flow, given all the models, you know, it was so hard to see your blue and green a little bit, but um, uh, that were some rivers going to be really heavily impacted, you know, of the 11 you looked at, and uh, others uh, were not uh, as sensitive to the different kinds of uh, climate models? Um, well, let's go ahead and just look at the data here. Um, so river by river, I know it's really hard for you guys to see, but the Stanislaus River has no significant differences um, in the difference in mean t-test, neither does Bear River. Um, so I don't know, and that wasn't, they, <laughs> there were no significant differences in duration or deficit from the data that we had. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. For showing that to me. Yeah. Good. Lauren, one more question from the room. Yeah, fantastic job. Thanks for sharing your work with us. Thank um, you. Thank you. Can you say more about the models and how they were used to calculate the projected stream flow? Yes. Yeah, so this was the projections were created by um, the Scripps Oceanography Institute, I believe. And so they took like they took climactic conditions um, that they had developed that um, would have the broadest range of conditions. So, you know, like it was aforementioned, the cool, wet scenario, the warm, dry, uh, the average scenario, and then other, which is how they defined the situation most unlike the first three. And they took that and they used the projected climactic conditions to um, predict the stream flow. And so I, they did that part of the research. I mostly did the data analysis, um, but I can share with you that information if you'd like to read into it a little bit more. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, so let's open it up for any questions from folks that are on Zoom. Uh, and Lauren, I'll, I'll help you facilitate this. Uh, so if there's folks that have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We're free to indicate uh, with the raise hand feature, and I'll just let you ask unmute and ask the question yourself. Okay, so we have a question from Dr. Fisher. Josh, go ahead and unmute. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks, Lauren. Really great work, and, and well done, uh, Dr. Field as well. Um, so it seems that, um, as you said, that the results vary depending on which model you kind of go with. Um, and. and I guess there are multiple models. There's more cool wet models. Is it the models or is it the scenarios that you were talking about? Because all the models ran the scenarios. 
Um, so I was confused as if you were talking about models or scenarios. I mean, the scenarios are models, but like. <laughs> um, so stop me if I misunderstood your question, but <laughs> these, the models, so it's under two different emission categories under the RCP 4.5 and 8.5. Um, 4.5 is kind of where we're at now. 8.5 would be an increased emission. And so the projected models are a representation of how the climate might react to these increased emission levels. So is the earth going to become warmer and drier or is it going to become cooler and wetter or somewhere in between? Um, so we can see real life how, how much we are continuing to emit. Um, if it's more, if it's less, we can, we can find a specific uh, representative concentration pathway. And then from there, we can begin to see how the climate is reacting to that and know whether to go with the um, warm, dry scenario, the average cool, wet or other. Okay, so do you, do you feel like um, because you have, there's kind of different models or different scenarios or different models that react to different scenarios in different right. ways. Um, because they kind of have different divergent pathways. Do you feel like that would lead to political, political stagnation in that there's not a clear um, trajectory for, you know, it could be cool, cooler and wetter, it could be hotter and drier. So like, you give, do you think policymakers are gonna be like, well, you know, we don't know what to do. I think that that's a really good point. Um, I would advise to at least just do a little bit on both sides so we're prepared for whatever might happen. It's my suspicion, and of course I don't know the future, but it's my suspicion that the earth will become wetter and drier just because of the thermodynamics of um, the earth's cycles. Hotter and drier? You mean hotter and drier? Yes, that's what I meant. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Right, well, but it also could become wetter and drier. That's a very, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, it's more extremes. Yeah, I meant, yes, warmer and drier. <laughs> Thank you. Lauren, let me, let me move on to the next question, which is from Dr. Tanner. And I'm just going to read it because it's in the chat. Uh, she says, great talk. Uh, and she's right. Uh, and then she asks, do you have any thoughts about how you could use these data to model agricultural futures for the state of California? Um, yes. I would use this data and kind of uh, maybe even start out with GIS, get a good mapping of where all of the agriculture hubs are within the state and kind of see where the rivers flow. Um, and looking at this map here and kind of overlaying this map with um, the agriculture hotspots within the state and kind of seeing, um, you know, dependent on the climactic conditions that, you know, warmer, drier, cooler, wetter, all of that, uh, kind of seeing how the real life scenario is playing out and use that to prep agriculture areas um, that are within, you know, a reasonable distance of each, um, of each river. I'm gonna use moderator privilege because we are at the end of your time, Lauren. So I'm gonna ask the last question and that is just gonna be, tell us a little bit about what's next for you. So I'm going to law school next year. I'll be going to Pace, uh, Pace Law. It's up in New York, and it's the number one environmental law school. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so I'll be moving out there here directly. And yeah. Awesome. Congratulations on that accomplishment. Thank and you. one more time, a great presentation, Lauren. Well done. Thank you, everyone. That wraps up our session. So thanks to all the speakers that are still around for a fantastic uh, set of talks. And thanks to, for everybody for being here and asking such great questions. So fantastic. Thank you, Lauren. Good job.